this is the House Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And today we are going to be just having a committee discussion on some of the work that is before us. I want to give you a couple of updates as well. First is the lead bill. As you remember, um, Emily Simmons thought that she had another potential delay coming forward. Um, she sorted that out. We do not need statutory language. So the only delay that we have at this point has to do with the lead bill. Um, I have asked uh, Michael O'Grady to just put a couple of findings into the bill. That was a request that came from leadership to make it a little bit more understandable why we're taking a bill and just crossing out four numbers, putting in four numbers. So, so that is that. And um, there's no appropriation. So I was going to bring that back on Friday uh, to, to, to represent that and do a possible vote. Are people okay with that? Are you comfortable with that? Or just a little discussion if you have a problem with that. Everybody seems okay. Okay. So we'll, we'll, we'll take that up and move that through. Um, the Act 173 delay is that that's Act 66. Um, no, excuse me, lead bill is Act 66. Act 173 delay, Representative Cooperly went up to appropriations and maybe you could fill us in a little bit on that, Larry, on, on, on that, how it went and what the vote was. And unmute. Got me? Can gotcha. you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, it was it was uh, a little contentious in some ways. Um, a, a couple of representatives were curious about extending the time for the uh, advisory committee and, and the costs involved in that. And um, a little difficulty, a little torture and explaining the, the finances to them over over the period of last year versus the 12 meetings um, going out to 2023. And I have to, uh, I certainly will commend uh, Jim for helping out there. It was great to have him available. Um, but it did come out of committee, uh, it did come out of appropriations with the 10-0-1 vote. So we're I think we're okay with that. Um, and we'll just see how it goes on the floor tomorrow. Yeah. So I, I believe, okay, so it went on the notice calendar today. So yes. So you should be, you're anticipating that that will be pulled off notice and, and you'll, you'll be ready to go. I'll be ready to go, I hope. Right. Yeah. Right. Should be okay. Um, Chip is going to report for appropriations. Okay. So that's good. Excellent. Um, we had a, a request from um, from our advocates to have someone from Sharon Academy come in and talk to us about their experience with proficiency-based learning uh, and remote learning. They had a little update on that, and I thought that could be of interest to us, so I accepted that to have them come in and talk with us about what proficiency-based learning and remote learning, how that, how that works together. Um, next week, we have the New England Board of Higher Education coming in, I love the term coming in, which you know what I mean. <laughs> um, they will be uh, talking with us about trends in higher education in New England and the rest of the country. So that'll be a, I think a very interesting conversation for us. I don't yet know what our committee role will be, but I think that we do need to be, uh, I do, we do need to be in the conversation and having a better sense of higher education uh, changes um, is probably a good use of our time. Um, as far as the 19 districts go, um, I'm looking to bring folks back on Friday, at which point we will we'll have a discussion to see uh, we, I had a conversation with Secretary of State as well as um, um, the League of Cities and Towns as well as um, I think JFO was there as well 
but I think we just need to have a conversation. I, I've asked the, um, the school boards association, I said, please do a survey. We need a survey. We need data from your members. Where are you with what's going on? You know, what do you need? What's the problem? Should we, what, what, what do you want us to do? I think we got a letter from, um, I think we all got a letter from uh, the Harwood um, uh, yeah. chair. And they are sh saying that they would be comfortable with the uh, FY 2020 budget. Um, I think there was also a little bit of lack of clarity that she thought that maybe they wouldn't have to vote and they would, they would be able to not deal with voting at all. And I think that that was something appealing. Um, at the same time, there are about three of those districts that would probably be fine with the FY20. Harwood is one, I think Slate Valley is one, and there's another one that I think would actually be okay. But as we know the uh, rest of them, I think Dylan, your district wouldn't do too badly. Um, you, you'd be struggling a little bit, but could probably figure it out. But there are other districts that really do, really are, that would be devastating if they're stuck with that. Um, so we're going to bring them back in and say, please, I only want to hear from you, from you districts that are affected. What, what do you want? <laughs> and what don't you want? Yeah, Larry. Yeah, Madam Chair, those budgets um, with Harwood, were they, they're okay with their FY20 budget, but does that also include the 4% inflator? No. Would they be, they, they, okay. Okay. They only had a, like a 1.3% increase on the Ed Fund. That yeah, and I'm it. sure that Slate Valley was relatively shy of 3% increase. Yeah. As well, yeah. so. And yeah, so there are a couple. I'm not sure about the. I'm not sure about the rest of them. I'm, I'm yeah. not sure about um, those other yeah. budgets. So we're asking them to. Well, we've got the we've got the nice list that um, Brad and Chloe gave us that. Um, we can certainly pull up. I, I maybe maybe um, Avery, you could take a look and see if you could find it, just so that we have an ability to look at those. But we'll we will have an opportunity to set, finally sort of decide uh, what what does the committee think. I don't know if I can do anything. I don't know if just waiting, doing nothing, and just seeing if we see who makes it through and we pick it up in August. I don't know. It'll be part of our committee conversation what we want to do. Um, Sarita, you had a question or a comment? Um, could you just clarify what the process is? I'm, I'm just a little confused. I understand, I guess, the bill is in the Senate. And so what happens now? Do we, does anything we do, can we have any impact until we take possession of that bill? I'm just a little confused about what the process is. Um, there was an agreement between the, um, I was actually part of that agreement with um, uh, the pro tem, the, the speaker, the, and the two chairs of education to agree that um, we would look at two bills that were COVID related in terms of, of that, that you could justify as being COVID related. Uh, one was the Act 173 delay and the other was dealing with the 19 districts. Um, we agreed that uh, it would start in the Senate and it would do that because they were further along than we were. They had already, they already had remote voting, we didn't. But we also agreed that we would have agreement between the two committees before anything moved. Um, we, we just didn't see that we were gonna be in a position for um, you know, a committee of conference, the, the complexity of it, we're, we're looking for something that uh, we, could, we could all agree on. And as you know, we were able to do that with Act 173. They came up with some ideas. We came up some with some ideas. They melded into one bill. And that, that was how we had anticipated this process working as well. Um, so at the moment, um, what I guess I think that Caleb was wondering, do we have an opinion on the, the FY20 budgets? Or do we just want to wait and see what happens with um, the feedback that we get on Friday? So just to clarify, so are we having the discussion so we can bring something into the discussion with the Senate so we can reach a compromise and then present one bill? Is that kind of what? 
at this the point, rationale is to have Yes, the rationale would be to see if we could get something that I could I could take to take to the other body to see if they would be more comfortable with that. Um, Peter Connor. Or reach a compromise, right? Yeah, that we'd have agreement before a bill left the committee. Left the committee. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah so, I, uh, Kate, I, I respect that process, and and I think that the idea of trying to do a, a conference committee when we're not in in the capital would be very challenging. Um, you know, I, I, I would still sort of return us back to the testimony we heard a couple of Fridays ago, which I thought was pretty um, potent. I, I'm glad we're getting some more clarity as to exactly the status of everybody's um, budget, because there were a few that were still hadn't necessarily been warned, we weren't sure, but also about what their plans are for voting. Um, and in various conversations I've had outside the committee, a lot of these districts are pretty committed to holding a vote of some kind before June 30th. Um, and it may be, it might be interesting to see how, you know, if we don't get an agreement in, in this part of our session, that may not be the end of the world. And I would just remind everybody that if nothing ever happens, we still have the fallback of current law, which allows districts to borrow up to 87% while they continue to vote until they have a budget. Um, so anyway, it's it, and they don't it, just uh, borrow eighty-seven percent. Yeah, right. They borrow. They as, borrow as, as they need it. Yeah, and okay. we're even. You know, mm -hmm. I think there's even legislation being looked at to use COVID money to cover any interest payments um, from that from that borrowing. So anyway, um, you know, the idea of waiting till August, knowing that we will more than likely have a session in August, uh, is worth contemplating. But I look forward to learning more on on Friday from these districts. There is a bill, um, I think it's up in appropriations, I think it might have been voted out, that's actually going to give um, uh, municipalities, uh, so if they have to borrow to pay their education property tax, so that the, the uh, municipalities collect the uh, education property taxes, and they give some directly to their school districts and the rest goes to the, to the, um, to the state for the ed fund. And there's some question uh, if they are unable to collect those taxes because people are struggling to pay their taxes, um, that they would, uh, th there's a possibility of using COVID money to pay the interest. So I think it's looking more at interest on money that the municipality borrowed in order to pay the uh, education property tax. We're gonna we're gonna need the money, so <laughs> gonna have to collect it. The schools are gonna need the money, and they felt that that could be probably COVID-related um, expense. Um, Peter, you still have your hand up. Is that new or is that okay, Sarita? Yep. Can you unmute? Are you, are you, is anybody hearing any conversation of the possibility of the state borrowing the money uh, for school districts and not asking the municipalities to borrow the money? Is, are you hearing any conversations anywhere about that? The conversations that we just had in um, Ways and Means, uh, where they were looking at setting the yield, one of the questions that 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 time was to say, um, do we set the yield, recognizing that we still have 166 million that we haven't covered, knowing that we're going to have to address that. And we can't put it on the back of property taxpayers, but we're, it would be a hole that we would need to fix. And maybe we could fix that in August. I don't know, that looking at it. That's on the table. Um, it could involve borrowing on, there could be, I'm sure that there could be borrowing involved um, to pay for education. Um, that's a conversation with the treasurer as well. Okay, thank you. The, the, the general fund I think is down 14% too. We're down, we're down 166 is what the expectation is. Anybody else? So, okay. 
Um, Caleb. Thanks. Um, I guess I just want to mention, I have some concerns about asking the VBSA uh, or their members to do any kind of survey or any additional work if we don't have reason to believe that that you know, work product will contribute to a viable process with the Senate. I just don't see this committee coming up with a bill that's gonna win over our colleagues in the Senate based on simply watching their proceedings on YouTube fairly closely over the last month and going back over that. And unless there's an indication that that's really different, I kind of feel that some of the testimony we already had um, was unfortunate because we couldn't be more responsive to it due to the Senate's kind of entrenched position. And so I would just hesitate to make another ask um, without feeling like that's got a place to land. Larry, did you have something? No. Yeah. Dylan? Yeah, I mean, I, I appreciate um, where Caleb's coming from on that. Um, but for me, the, the piece of information that I really want is the lay of the land with regard to how districts are moving forward with votes, uh, because I think that the timing will really provide us with some clues as to when we will fully understand, probably in June, um, how much pressure is going to build for a solution if, in fact, we do not act on a bill prior to the end of the fiscal year. So in other words, I'm trying to understand the timeline when we will get feedback from the field on if votes are approved or not. So in my local district, it's really June 2nd or thereabouts is my uh, time when I'll know uh, how, uh, how much pressure we'll be facing here locally based upon the outcome of the vote. And I expect there will be a string of other votes along the way as well. And to me, those pieces of evidence are just really important. And I'd like to understand now as much as I can what the timeline's gonna be so that we can understand, well, maybe we do need to act more immediately. But I do sympathize, Caleb, with that, that you know, we don't wanna put more on the plates of these districts um, if we don't think we're gonna reach agreement. But I still think we're in the phase of figuring out if we can, and the pressure that builds in the field will probably inform us. So you'd, you. need, you'd need those back in two weeks, right? I'm sorry, the results? In order to, be, to have them ahead of June, correct? Just, just in week is really important to me. And then whatever comes in after, I do think it will inform the decisions right up to the end of the fiscal year for as long as this body is meeting. I asked them to get that to us for, by Friday. I asked if it was possible to get that by Friday and they indicated that they could. Um, there was another hand I saw up, but it's disappeared, where'd it go? Was it, was it, was it Peter Conlon, was it you? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that um, both the superintendents and the school boards are in frequent, constant contact with these 19 districts. So getting the information we needed really isn't, wasn't a big ask. Yeah. So where are you in the process? Do you have a meeting? <laughs> do you have a budget? <laughs> Is it warned? And, what and would do happen they plan to you if, if this happened? Yeah. Well, and also, do they plan be. to go ahead with a vote? Do they plan to go ahead with a vote? Exactly. Um, and it, it may be that we're going to have a bunch of districts that are budgets are going to pass, you know, and we only have a few districts that we're they're dealing with. Sarita. Um, just this is a little off topic, but it's again, I don't know if we could combine two things with one, but I do we have any data on um, districts that don't have access to broadband. I didn't know if that could be a question that could be asked as well if they're asking questions, if we're uh, compiling. I believe, I believe the secretary is gathering that information. I can check back on that. I believe okay. he was gathering that. When I asked okay, them that, that, early, when I asked, when I asked the superintendents in the early stages, it was a very stressful question that I asked. So I believe that I believe the secretary is is gathering that information. Kayla. Yeah, just so to clarify, so I didn't realize we'd already asked for this survey. Um, yeah. So what are we hoping? So so I guess I'm confused. Are we trying to take what we learn this Friday 
and incorporate it into either our draft 6.1 or 7.1? Or are we looking to learn something that will bring us closer to the Senate? Like, what's the goal? Like, what is the policy goal of whatever we're going to hear from this survey you've requested? I think it's getting a better lay of the land from actually what's happening. What are the effects? If we do one, two, or three, what's the effect on you? Um, is is I think. And, and so that in the survey, we, kind of, we laid out one, two, and three. I have, I, I have, in my conversation with them, we talked about those issues. I have not seen the survey. Um, Peter, you were involved in that conversation. We, were we fairly yeah, specific? Yeah, you know, what we're really, yeah, for me, um, a lot of it is if if we find out that of these 19, 17 have got a worn budget, they plan to go ahead with a vote, they've got a vote scheduled, they've got the logistics in place, and it's all going to happen before June 30th, to me, that that might, be, might make me say, okay, you know something, let's just not do anything until we get see what the results of all of that is. And therefore, in August, we may have three districts that are really struggling that we have to that we have to um, deal with. Um, or we might find out that these folks have no vote scheduled because they're scared of, of holding votes, um, in which case we might need to, to move quicker than that. Uh, but really, the, you know, the information I think I'm looking for is th those definite plans, um, budgets in place. Uh, you know, I don't I'm not necessarily, I, I think we, we have a good idea of what the impact of not having a budget or the Senate's proposal but I'm interested also in the, in the impact of doing nothing for the time being. Go ahead, Caleb. Um, I, I believe my hand's down. Oh, okay. Just wanna make sure that, that you get your question finished just um, a second. I'll have to call you back. <laughs> um, what was I gonna say? So um, yeah, and it's, it's really just to see what, what's the next best step for us? Is it for me to go to the Senate and say, listen, I think we've come up with another solution. Are you in, could, would you consider this? Do we say, golly gee, it sure looks like the Senate idea is a great idea. Let's just go ahead and pass it. Although there are some fixes that need to happen as well because there are a couple of things that are missing and related to voting. Um, uh, or do we just wait? And I'm hoping that this conversation will help inform our decision. Are there questions that, that folks would, would want to have from the school districts? I'm just, I'm concerned with, you know, with putting these, these budgets out. I'm not sure what the flavor is right now with, with, with voters. Um, I'm not so sure that a lot of these these budgets are going to pass. Um, just, I guess, just wait and see what happens. Um, but as far as the, you know, as far as going to the Senate, Kate, I think we know pretty much where we stand with the Senate in, in terms of coming up with solutions. At least uh, Senator Baruth, I think, has been very clear that it's his bill and that's the way it is. Um, I don't know how anyone else feels about that, but that's the message I have. Well, these are, those are all in the area of kind of conjecture. <laughs> um, it's not, it's not I mean, fact at this point. <laughs> right, I think it's a matter of public record at this point. Um, so that's just kind of where, where we're, I'm looking at this moment in time. Um, it's possible that it's possible we do nothing and we wait. It's possible that we come up with another solution. It's possible when we demonstrate that this is really hurtful to this number of districts that they might want to consider another route. It's possible that they won't. Um, I, I'm, I guess what I'm just trying to do is say, what is the thing that we can do? Is there something we can do that is going to deal with the challenges in voting uh, addressing the equity um, concerns that we have going forward. 
And um, in addition to the, the very complex financial issues that we're facing with the education fund, be able to keep those things in mind and move forward thoughtfully. Kathleen. Okay, um, you've asked the VSBA to get back to us this week and we're scheduled to talk about this at two o'clock on Friday? Friday, yes, okay. it's on the agenda. That's good for me. You're good. Um, Peter, no, Sarita? Just, would it be helpful to know without a 4% inflator what the impact would be on their programming? Would that be helpful? I'm not, you know, I don't know if that's a helpful piece of information for us. Uh, Avery, did you find that document from Brad James? I can send it to you. I I'll think. pull up what I think is, is the right one and you can let me know if it's the correct document. I think it says April 24th on the top of it. Um, it, it might have been in Ways of Beans. I don't know. I think it was. Yes, that's the one I'm looking for. April 23rd. There we go. So um, if you look at the budgets of the failed districts, you can see where they were. And then you can go over and see what their revised budgets look like. So we have, um, you know, on one, one level, we have down here Harwood that um, would be facing with their revised budget a 1.4% increase. So they were thinking we could probably live with live with, with that and would rather have that than to do the borrowing or vote or, or whatever. Um, if you look up at Alberg, that doesn't work quite as well. Um, if you look down at those that have not yet voted, could you scroll up a little bit? And you can also figure in, you can also look at these numbers and see where it would be in terms of if, if it were only 4%, how far off. So that, that gives you an indication there. So we have Wyndham Northeast, that probably would be just fine. Um, Rivendell, not so good. Um, West River, okay, probably, if we're looking just at proposed ed spending. So for some of them, um, if it were level funded, could probably make it work. 4% um, was one that was also recommended. It, for me, it, it sort of didn't make sense because we had such a range. Uh, why would we want to give Harwood 4%? <laughs> when they only need 1.4. So that's, I, 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 I see these as uh, strange bedfellows in that they all come with very, very different needs with a, a, quite a range uh, of challenges. So doing a flat 4% and it, what's funny is actually the, the, the average for the other uh, 77, uh, budgets, I believe, was actually 4.7. So 4% right. came from that, only they lowered a little bit. So while, while, while no increase <clears throat> is going to be OK for some, 4 is going to be OK for others, and for others, it's just not. Um, so again, I think I, I have tried to explain to some of these, these people that I've spoken with is, go for a vote. Don't wait. For, for us, and I think some are waiting for us and encouraging them to say, no, you need to vote. You need to go for a vote. And um, I hope that that is coming through. Uh, Kate, if, if I may, Sarita, if you're interested in programmatic impacts, I'd refer you back to the testimony, which we have a fair amount of written testimony from Friday the 24th of April, um, which really spelled out a lot of the impacts in some of these districts. Right, no, I know, it, it, it's concerning to me you know, on some of the districts, the impact that it will be if they have to just go back to the 87%. So, anything else? I, so, I just want to yeah. clarify something. Sarita, they've spoke about the impact if they have to go to 2020 spending, not to funding at 87%. And a lot of districts borrow right now anyway. Thank you. I mean, not now. A lot of districts are using the using the borrowing power to get through, uh, you know, the, the first part until they get their first first payment. 
So I think they get paid. Is it September 1st or 2nd? Is it you school board members? You know that 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 Ed Fund is distributed to you. Money is distributed. September 10th. September 10th. Thank you, Jim. So so there are districts that are going to borrow anyway because they're not going to have their their money until September. So so that's what it's there for. Anything else? Caleb, I want to make sure that uh, I'm hearing you in, in this process. Uh, yeah, I feel heard. You know, I don't feel agreed with, but I don't expect to. Yeah. Um, it would help if Caleb would bring his daughter into the picture on his lap during these conversations. <laughs> <laughs> well, she agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're, so so part of let me just see if, go ahead casey what i'm just gonna say give that time and she won't agree yeah. with him all the time. yeah that's that's uh that's a certainty casey in a world of few certainties that is one so part of your concern is just the futility of working on this is that correct uh it, it's a it's an optics thing. I, I'm embarrassed about the testimony we took, um, given what had happened on YouTube in the Senate just the day before. It was discordant. It was poorly um, integrated between our chambers, and it's it's critically important, and it's sending a confused message. And if, if the place we're going to end up is the status quo or the Senate's version, then I would prefer to stop taking testimony on things other than that, because I think it sends a signal that something may happen, which I logically do not see a path to happening. That, that's my concern. I feel the pain. So I see this as our last, our last ditch effort um, to see, basically to see would we be better off waiting? Would we be better off going with the Senate view, Senate version? Or is it worth trying to pursue uh, a different option? And Kate, if I may, I guess I should just admit that also philosophically, I have a very hard time with the default budget concept. And if we have any bill with default budgets, I would love our decision to be unanimous. And I think that's the only, vir well, that is a virtue of the Senate's bill is that it has a default budget and it was a bipartisan decision. And if we're gonna put up a different version against theirs, I hope we can say the same. My quote of the month is from um, Neil deGrasse Tyson, which is, uh, you know enough to know you're right, but you don't know enough to know you're wrong. And I think we've done a, a pretty solid job of, of speaking with the people affected um, by this. And that wasn't to you not knowing enough. <laughs> That's, that was not personally to you. But we sometimes move forward with incomplete information. Okay, um, anything else? That's really all we were doing today. Um, so we'll do lead, we'll do, I'm hoping we'll do lead on Friday. Um, if, if I, uh, Avery, if you could reach out to Michael O'Grady and see if he'd be available on Friday to finish up lead. And with that also, um, I, I just need to send a note to Ann Pugh as well, um, that we're going to be taking that up so that they know. It's really just as you remember to deal with testing in schools that are closed. Um, Larry, did you have a question or a statement? Yeah, I think if we're, if we're pretty much complete with the meeting, I just would like to ask Dylan um, if he can respond to maybe some of the meetings that are going on with the state colleges. Mm. Would you like me to do that now? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. If you can. Sure. Uh, so we, we have had a lot of meetings over the last couple of weeks um, and had one most recently yesterday. Uh, so we've had a series of events uh, that you've probably read a bit about. 
the first was, of course, the chancellor proposed uh, the reconfiguration of the system. Um, what followed was uh, within a fairly short amount of time, uh, public opinion uh, boiled over on that. And we got a lot of instruction from uh, both our statewide leaders, legislative leaders and others um, that urged us to preserve uh, rural access points uh, where those campuses currently reside. And so the Board of Trustees uh, went through some deliberations. Ultimately, that led to the Chancellor's resignation. Um, and so we have been going through a period of flux. Uh, we appointed an interim Chancellor who was the uh, General Counsel, Sophie Zadotny. Got to make sure I get my pronunciations correct here. Uh, Sophie is, is really uh, an excellent member of the team who is a longstanding member of the Chancellor's office staff. Um, and she's been uh, very strong so far at keeping us looped in on what's going on as a board. So I've been appreciative of that. Um, we've had several other things happen uh, in the uh, Rutland area in particular at Castleton University. Uh, the president of the university submitted her resignation after uh, some press reports. You've probably read about that. Um, and you know, we as a board, uh, regretfully accepted her resignation. Uh, we have appointed a uh, interim president who I saw, it sounds like Representative Toof knows him quite well. He's a, a well-liked, uh, I think he's in the humanities department, a history professor with a lot of expertise. Um, I wanna make sure I get the name right here, the pronunciation, I think it's John Spiro. Do I have that right or is it Spiro? I wanna make sure I don't screw up any names here. Um, yeah. <laughs> You're good. He's, he's come forward as well with a great spirit of partnership. Um, and, and I really, you know, being a, a someone who really likes uh, history, as you know, I'm, I'm very glad to work with him. But also, he clearly has a love of the institution. He's been there for quite a while. And I've actually heard from a lot of past students and members of the campus community who regard him very highly. Um, so I'm very encouraged by that. Um, the actual steps that we've taken since that time uh, have been discussed in a public setting, so I'll share some of them. Uh, we've held a variety of meetings with members of the campus community. Notably, I had an opportunity uh, on the board, which is a 15 member board. We have a student trustee uh, who's been wonderful and she has coordinated uh, different types of community conversations with students and otherwise. I had the chance last week to sit in on a meeting with the interim chancellor and the student community. Um, a big part of this is gonna be uh, communicating after some of this fallout has occurred uh, and making clear that it is an open process going forward. So everyone who's been participating has been trying to uh, gear our activities in that direction. Now, the most substantive thing that happened uh, most recently was at yesterday's meeting. We had a board meeting yesterday afternoon uh, where we received updates from each of our campuses. So we heard updates uh, from Castleton University, we heard updates from Vermont Technical College, we heard updates from NVU, um, and we heard updates from the Community College of Vermont. We're encouraged generally with some of the positive uh, signals we're getting around uh, where we stand in the budgeting process around budget adjustment. Um, I know our CFO and others have worked to provide uh, very rapidly information to the General Assembly about the budget, about our needs from the COVID-19 emergency for consideration both in the budget adjustment context, but future decisions as well. Um, it was announced last week by the speaker, you heard probably in our all member caucus that the Joint Fiscal Office uh, has retained a person with expertise in higher education, a person who was the chancellor of the main system most recently, uh, who is doing a complete analysis of just where we stand, which I think is a situational analysis for legislative leaders as they make decisions about uh, how to provide bridge funding and what that process looks like. Meanwhile, at the campuses, and this is the core piece from yesterday, um, there are a lot of initiatives going on. So for instance, Northern Vermont University has convened stakeholders and a group that is uh, looking at some goals that they've set forth uh, for how to move that system forward and what they need to achieve. Um, there's some great information there and I'd be happy to say, send it to Avery if you're interested, but they're calling that the NVU Strong Initiative. Um, Vermont Tech, under the leadership of President Moulton, has convened process as well with local community stakeholders um, and they're working through different groups in areas such as agriculture and a variety of others um, business and, and other categories to try to figure out what they're going to do moving forward as well. 
Uh, the Community College of Vermont always stands ready to provide support. And Castleton University, which has experienced a lot of uh, shakeup recently, I think that they're also working through this process and, and there's just a slightly different dynamic there because of some of the immediate changes that occurred. But um, I, I do wanna let this group know, I mean, I'm very encouraged. It's amazing what the campus communities can do when turned loose. Uh, and there, I have a lot of confidence and respect in all of our presidents and all of our leaders um, and the entire uh, faculty, the campus community as it relates to support staff and others, the students, they're all pulling in the same direction. Um, of course, we do know, not to opine on what's going on at the University of Vermont, but we do know that this is not a, something that's just happening at our state colleges system. It's happening at other post-secondary institutions, the University of Vermont, and many private institutions. Um, what I'm also encouraged by, and this is good for this group to know, is that we've heard that uh, the Association of Independent Colleges here in Vermont, the University of Vermont, and the Vermont State Colleges system are meeting, are discussing uh, options to move forward. And there's individual initiatives with the campuses and the Vermont State Colleges uh, interacting with the privates in the region and others. So I think that the whole landscape, they're trying to work together. Uh, where this all leads, we don't know yet, um, but I expect we'll be learning more. Our goal in the Vermont State Colleges system at this point is we've instructed our executive committee, which is a subgroup within the board uh, leadership to work on a timeline uh, to set out a process for uh, pulling in a longer term interim chancellor. Well, we have an interim chancellor. Um, I would describe it uh, as on an emergency basis for this quick transition. So you go to someone within the organization with expertise who can make decisions as we work through. But we need to get someone in there probably over the span of a year or so. And we discussed this on our board meeting yesterday who has expertise and, and perhaps um, you know, an, an understanding of the complexities of organizational change, um, because I think that there is a realization both from the signals we, we've received from state leaders, but also internally that we're gonna need to make some structural changes to sort our way through this. Um, and as you might imagine, as we discuss these things and move into a process of selecting an interim, a longer term interim chancellor, um, there's probably gonna be a lot of anxiety out there. So if you hear it in your communities, Larry, if you're hearing it in the Rutland region, Jay, if you're hearing it down in your neck of the woods, uh, Lynn, if you're hearing it up in the kingdom, um, please let me know, because that feedback loop is really helpful. And, and I recognize there's a lot of bruised feelings. So um, do know that I'm just trying to do my part to listen and to receive information and be a conduit to this body. So I hope that helps. That's sort of the most that I know at this point, but there's a lot going on out there. Thank you, Dylan. Doing a great job. Keep up the good work. Kate, you're, you, Kate, you're, you're, uh, I'm sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> Kathleen. Yeah, um, thanks Dylan. I just wanted to make sure um, I understood sort of the lay of the land. So sounded like there was a, a task force or a committee at each of the campuses and then um, an independent consultant who'd been hired. I was reading about him in Digger this morning, a, a consultant from Maine who was gonna take a really hard look sort of at the finances and, and the structure and deliver a report by the end of June, it sounded like. And then the search for a, a chancellor or a long-term chancellor is ongoing. So there's, it doesn't sound yet like there's a statewide, it sounds like the pieces are coming together for there to maybe be a statewide task force or the pieces, the pieces will be put into place for some sort of long-term visioning plan once all of these components are assembled. Yeah, based off of the, the memos that have come out from the pro tem and speaker, part of it that they've described is once they assess the overall condition, um, as the system begins its own processes, it, it appears based off of the way I've read it that they also want a broader look at it. So I've heard some say, oh, it'll be a blue ribbon commission on higher education. Um, and of course, we've had a lot of suggestions. I, I don't feel like I'm speaking out of turn to say, I'm getting feedback all the time of, is it time to look at the Vermont State Colleges and UVM and perhaps a different governance structure where they are connected somehow or one system? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think, I'm not sure what the outcome will be because there have been previous discussions 
about unifying the system and there have been blue ribbon commissions uh, in the last decade or so, and they have not uh, recommended that. However, given the changing landscape, that may be part of it. But yeah, you're absolutely right. You have the big facts down. Okay, I just wanted to make sure because it, it seems like the only, um, it seems like the solution needs to be a very uh, big picture, long-term thing. And everything I heard you describing uh, individually didn't seem like that. It seemed like the ingredients for that. So, all right, thanks. Yeah, and, and I just wanna say as well, I was so excited to see the NEVI discussion scheduled for next week um, because we obviously, we, we have a lot to learn from what's going on in our region. Um, and I know that people on this committee are plugged into that process very closely. It's just, it, it appears to me that the, one of the things that we need to do a really good job up here is setting the table that this is not a Vermont specific problem. I mean, we can, we can discuss and debate the funding level that, the, that we have provided to post-secondary education in the state relative to what we used to provide. That's a very important debate, but there's also um, things conspiring against post-secondary education more broadly. And, and I wanna make sure that everyone has an understanding of them because I think that'll best inform our decisions, particularly when it comes time to make decisions about how we prioritize funding and so forth. Casey? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to thank Dylan for the update. I really appreciate it. This is the, the state colleges is something people in my area take advantage of. We have UVM that's a half an hour uh, south of us, but a lot of kids still, um, a lot of students will utilize um, Northern Vermont. I'm a, I went to Castleton. I had a bunch of friends uh, went to Castleton. So this is really important for our area too. So I really appreciate the update. Thanks. Yeah, so get your questions ready for Nebby for next week. Um, so this will be a real opportunity to get a, a, a little bit higher level view of what's happening with post-secondary education, particularly since we've been, so much has been remote as of late. And I think um, with that, um, I'll see you Friday. Um, and should be just those two items. Um, and on Wednesday, we should see uh, our uh, vice chair do a spectacular job on 173. Um, and Kathleen, if we do lead, um, you, were, you were on the uh, committee that reported that bill. Would you be prepared to report that if we, if we get to that point of voting it out? <laughs> sure, T tomorrow? I can um, do it tomorrow, I'm just no, confirming. No, okay. no, no, we haven't <laughs> voted it out yet. <laughs> I didn't think so, but yeah. um, I had no recollection of voting it out, but uh, you know, I thought we were talking about tomorrow, so I had a little panic, but yes. Yeah, so, yeah I'm, sure, I'm happy to report lead whenever that's ready. Okay, excellent. So with that, we are fini. Okay, thanks.